Hello and welcome to the seventh webinar in 12D's training webinar series. My name is Lisa Stewart and I'm the Marketing and Communications Coordinator here at 12D Solutions. While we wait for everyone to finish joining and get comfortable, I'll just launch a polling question. You'll have about 30 seconds to answer about your current knowledge of stormwater hydrology and hydraulics and then I'll show the results. Okay, it looks like we've, most people have a bit of knowledge of this topic, but we've got a few beginners in, in here, so I'm sure everyone will get a lot out of the webinar today. Our 12D training webinars will showcase common industry challenges, taking a close look at industry best practices and how these can be implemented using 12D model software. The aim of these webinars is to upskill 12D model users and broaden their understanding of the capabilities of 12D model. We also run regular training courses all around Australia and New Zealand. See our website for more details on these or indicate in your post-webinar survey that you'd like to be contacted about this or in-house training. We'll keep running these webinars regularly and recording them for posting on our website and on YouTube. Our first six webinars from this training series, as well as the first 11 webinars from our Industry Solutions series, are available online if you missed those. During this live presentation, you'll be able to type your questions along the way, as shown on the screen and we'll answer as many as possible throughout the webinar. At the end, I'll also read out some of your questions to the presenter for his insights if there's time. Today's webinar, Fast Method for Estimating Overland Flows, will be presented by Owen Thornton, who has been writing software for 12D Solutions since 2003. Owen has 15 years of professional experience in the civil and mining industries. He is the original author of 12D's Drainage Network Editor and Drainage Analysis Module, and is a 12D specialist in drainage, utilities, plot parameter files, survey conformance, volumetrics, and system setup. This webinar from the training series will showcase a simple and fast method for estimating flow rates and depths within the natural and engineered waterways of a digital terrain model. From a rudimentary model of catchments, flow paths are generated automatically down the waterways and the catchment runoff is gradually routed along them. Normal flow depths are calculated and displayed at fine intervals along the waterways, conforming perfectly to the terrain model. Over to you, Owen. Thank you, Lisa. Hello, everyone. Today, as Lisa just suggested, we are going to look at a fast method for estimating overland flows. This method is primarily going to use your finished surface tin or your terrain model uh, that you will have already modelled or surveyed uh, to produce a tin surface and with a bare minimum of drainage strings we are going to uh, produce a catchment model and an overland flow model and the overland flow model will be cutting sections automatically from the tin surface uh, and analysing those sections to see whether water can be conveyed along them and the model will route the catchment flows along these um, channels and table drains and what have you uh, to produce a model that conforms perfectly to the tin. So let's have a look at this inside 12D model. And what we have here is a fairly simple project where we have a small uh, road network, perhaps something like an industrial site or something like that. Uh, the general fall of the land is from top right to bottom left and we, as well as the roads we have a series of um, table drains along the top of the road here um, coming down to low points here, here and here and at those low points there are culverts going underneath the road network and being the flow from those culverts is being picked up by channels on the downstream end which uh, meander through the tin down to this main channel at the bottom here and it all flows off down to a low point down the bottom here. Now all of uh, the strings that we see on the screen here with the exception of the, uh, the culvert strings uh, crossing the road there, there and there are simply design strings from an apply MTF. So we can use this geometry, we've created a, uh, a super tin of all of these component tins and we've got a single finished surface now representing our survey and the channels and the road um, and we can see here a, a section of one of these culverts here where you can see the channels have been built in uh, on either side um, and what we're going to do now is show you how you can estimate the flow rates and the flow depths very very quickly in 12D um, using 
mainly this uh, terrain model, this tin that we have produced of all of these design strings. Uh, we're going to use drainage strings only very sparingly and that's only as dummy strings as a means to link a catchment model uh, to an overland flow model. Now the first step will be to produce an overland flow model. So I'm just going to uh, say zoom into a particular area of interest, say here, and I'll toggle on my line styles. And you can see what I have here uh, in place is a model of these green um, uh, overland flow strings, otherwise known as bypass strings. And they're very easy to produce. I can use the channel center lines, either the, the super line, or actually the, the super strings from the apply MTF functions from all of your uh, um, apply many functions, apply MTF functions to produce these. Now, or they won't automatically come out pointed in the right direction. So we have a tool that will do this for us. Uh, that tool is under the drainage menu. So design, drainage, sewer, downhill strings. And this option is quite a good option to use to get you started here. It will do 99% of the job for us. Uh, I've got a screen layout file, in fact, that's already set up to show us how to fill in this panel. So I'll just load that up now. Get rid of this one. And what this panel has been set up to do is take all of the models that contain my uh, design channel strings, and they're in models to match this wildcard. They've got a prefix of deschan for design channel. If you look at my model list on the view here, you can see they're all on the view here, all of these ones. And not the road strings, they've got a different naming convention there. Within all of these deschan strings models, um, the centre line of the channel has got a prefix of RSD. Uh, so it's going to find all of the uh, centre lines in all of these channels and it's going to uh, process them, copy them into a new model, this model of downhill strings. Now I've already got one in this model DRX Overland. Uh, I don't want to overwrite it so I'm going to put it in a different model here and automatically add that to my design view. And I might change the colour there so it's a bit easier to see. I might change it to red. And this will just go and take a copy of all of these centre line strings, into, put them in this new model called example, colour them red and point them all in the downhill direction. The only real requirements for these strings is that they be super strings and that they have Z values on them so that we can tell which way is uphill and which way is downhill. It automatically detects where the crests and sags are and these tolerance value, the levy tolerance values in here are that one set to 10 millimetres. So if you've got a little wobble or glitch in your string uh, that you don't really want um, it to find or detect the crest or a sag that's only 10 millimetres or, or smaller, 12D will work its way through that and only detect the real uh, crests and sags in the string. Uh, once the panel's filled in like that, though, it's also going to join them head to tail uh, so that we have nice continuous strings. If I go and run this now, I get this red model of bypass strings. And that's what I started with when I created this green model. I'll just finish this one now and finish that. Uh, and you'll notice it's just gone along all of the channel centre lines. What it hasn't done, though, is continued along the path of the culvert. So. I'll just remove that red model now and see the green one. So what I've manually done beforehand, I won't do it now just to save us a bit of time. I've just extended one of these incoming strings so that it joins up with the string further downstream in each case uh, so that we have a string going uh, along the path of where the culvert is as well. Um, just to better explain this model too, I've got a profile of one of my table drains on the right bottom right here of my screen. And if you can just see as I move my mouse around on the section view, you can see the crosshair in the plan view as well. So here's the top of the channel on the left. Coming down to the culvert here, you can see the culvert on the section view. Then it's going up to a high point around here. Uh, and then it, the flow goes back down to the other side at this point and uh, back up to the top of the channel up here. Now all of this was a single um, apply many function. This is the centre line that we're looking at here. And you can see it goes uphill and downhill and that downhill strings option has automatically split the centre line in the target model, in the downhill strings model, 
uh, so that we have individual strings now pointing to the low points. So it's going down this way and down that way, down this way and down this way. Okay, so it's done a fair bit of work for us and we've just joined the dots effectively and drawn the strings uh, over the catchments to join them all up together. It's really not much more complicated than that in terms of what needs to be done for that part. So now we have what uh, we could consider a usable um, overland flow model. And to um, get some water running through this overland flow model and what 12D will do when it uh, does this is at regular intervals along these green arrowed strings here, it will cut sections from our tin and analyze those sections and check the longitudinal slope and all of that sort of thing to make sure it's a proper channel. And then with the catchment flows, uh, whatever flow rate happens to be at any particular point, it will try and fit a flooded width string to that channel based on the normal depth of flow, as in Manning's calculation uh, at regular intervals along these strings. And that's what we're trying to do here. We're basically trying to build up a very simple water um, watershed model based on the rational method, uh, but it's a very simplistic version of the rational method. So from this, you can probably just see on the screen there, I might zoom out a touch, there are these seven uh, little yellow blobs. And these are the points that I'm interested in in terms of determining um, peak discharge rates at these points. I'm going to determine it all the way along the flow rates, all the way along these strings, but I wanted to break it down into uh, sub areas there. And for each one of these little um, uh, discharge points, I want to create a catchment for that point. So I've gone ahead and done this in advance here. I'll add them on the screen now. They're in these two models here. So I've got seven catchments overall, all um, made nice colours with a bit of uh, translucent fill on them so that they're easy to see. And all of these seven catchments will all end up flowing down to this one point at the bottom here. Uh, and we're going to um, route these catchment flows along our bypass or overland flow strings uh, and progressively the flows will build up as, we, uh, as they move downstream. Now, how do we link the two together? Is that the key here is to use dummy drainage strings where the upstream end of the drainage string or one, any inlet on the drainage string is set as what's called a bypass node. A bypass node is simply a drainage pit or a drainage node, if you like, that has zero inlet capacity. So the drainage strings that we're modeling here are going to run entirely dry. No water will ever get into them. They're purely there to establish a link between the catchment model and the overland flow model. All the flow will stay on the overland flow model, but it needs a link via a dummy drainage string so that the catchments flow onto the bypass strings, onto the, onto the overland flow model. So if I zoom into an area, say, around uh, here, Uh, you can see this um, little string I've drawn here, this yellow string that look, got a leader pointing out to this bit of text. It is actually yellow, but the colour of the polygon underneath, uh, on top has changed the colour of it. But use your imagination and we'll call it yellow. Uh, this little yellow string is actually a drainage string. If I do an F2 inquire and click there, it tells me it's a drainage string. And I've put um, seven of these little drainage strings in my model. Um, each drainage string has to have two points. Unfortunately, you can't just have a single point drainage string. It needs to have two points. But what I've done here for cosmetic reasons is this is the upstream node here where you see the circle. And then uh, that is the actual bypass node that links to the catchment and also to the bypass strings. And so we have two bypass strings forming a junction at this node and, t and merging into one, departing the node. But the, the pipe on this two-point drainage string, and again, this is just a dummy, I've set that to zero, and I've set the downstream pit size here to zero as well. So cosmetically, it looks like a little leader line pointing to this piece of text, which is going to tell us the flow rate that we generate um, at each one of these bypass nodes. So it's a, I guess it's a, a cute little way of doing these bypass, uh, dummy bypass nodes. In truth, you could do them any way you like, because it's only these nodes that are important, but the way I've done it there um, looks good visually as well. Now to create one of these bypass nodes, well as long as you can draw a two-point string in 12D, 
um, you can create a bypass node. Uh, from the drainage toolbar, for instance, you can click on create drainage string and you can pick on one of your other ones. So I'll use the same as button there and select one of these other drainage strings. I've already got seven in here, so I changed the name to, to uh, eight. Uh, and I can then go and hit ahead and hit the create button. Then I could go ahead and use the edits, add append, and just go and digitize another node wherever I want to. So it's only a two-point drainage string where the upstream pit is set as what's called a bypass node. Basically, any pit type you like that's got zero inlet capacity is sufficient, but we do have a uh, standard pit type in our drainage.4D that ships with 12D model that's called bypass node or BP node. Okay, so it's as simple as that for getting these bypass nodes in place, and you place them at the discharge points of each catchment. So however many catchments you have, you draw that many bypass nodes. They could all be in one string. In this case, I've drawn them my seven catchments with seven bypass strings uh, and seven bypass nodes uh, as well. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven catchments and seven bypass nodes. Once you've got those drainage strings in place, the levels of those bypass nodes don't matter at all. Uh, we can simply load that dummy drainage model into the drainage network editor and pick on any of those nodes you like. And it's in a model called uh, Drainage Dummy there because these are all dummy nodes. And you can see they're all, all of these nodes are set with the pit type called BP node. And that uh, makes it, uh, automatically gives it zero inlet capacity. So that the, the, the no flow will ever get into the drainage strings. It will all stay on the bypass strings. Uh, moving over to the global tab here. Uh, we can see we're running the rational method here with the runoff method. We're using the uh, standard Brisbane rainfall file, so all of, we're assuming that this project is in Brisbane and the rainfall is going to be um, set for that. And we've got our tin set as well, our super tin, which is all of our design elements and our survey all together in a super tin. Over on the utility models tab, here is where we establish the link between the catchment model and the overland flow model. You can see I've got the catchment section all set up here with a catchments file and there's my overland flow model. That's the green arrowed strings that we, I mentioned before with the downhill strings option. Um, so let's have a quick look in this catchments file to see what we've got. It's a simple file. We're only using set number one from the catchments here. So each of these catchments is linked to the set number one on each of these bypass nodes. That's that model there, the uh, drainage dummy catchment. And we've also got this other model, the pervious TC strings model called drainage dummy TCP for time of concentration pervious. Let's have a look at that one briefly. Uh, DR dum TCP, there it is. So what I've done in addition, and this is entirely optional, but these little yellow strings that I've drawn are just strings that I've drawn in um, trying to um, estimate uh, the longest path or the, 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 the longest time path from the top of each catchment until its discharge point. So I've gone through each of these and a couple of these catchments, this brown one here and this purple one here, they include the road catchment uh, as well. Now the road drainage is, is done separately from the culverts and all of that, but it will ultimately, possibly through water quality basins, end up uh, being added on into these two downstream channel reaches here on the downstream end of the road. So I've included the road catchment in here as well because that will ultimately end up in, the ch in these two channels here. Um, but I've, for each catchment I've drawn what I think is the longest path and 12D will link those automatically to the bypass nodes as well as the catchments and you'll get these labels and all, or, and all of that sort of thing as well. Uh, so that when you hit the set catchments button, you can go and look at each individual node and you'll see as well as linking in uh, the catchment polygon, like so, and calculating the area in hectares, it's also going to measure the length of the TC string, the yellow one, and the equal area slope. It's calculating the grade of this. We just drew these yellow strings in as 2D, but it's automatically set that against our finished surface tin and calculated its equal area slope. And those two numbers, the length and the slope, are fed into, um, the. in this case, our default is the kinematic wave equation uh, to give us um, a calculated time of concentration. Now, that is entirely uh, optional. 
If you wanted to, you could pick a different option like direct, in which case it's not going to use these numbers and you can specify your own TC. But if you're unsure um, of how to estimate TCs or you're not that experienced, you might be better off drawing these TC strings and getting 12D to calculate it via one method or another. I've chosen kinematic wave in this equation. In this occasion. Uh, you could just as easily use one of the others, like say the Friend equation or the Bransby-Williams equation or any of the others that we see listed here. Not all of them are going to be appropriate for this job. And you know, obviously these ones mentioned in the QDOM manual, the Queensland Urban Drainage Manual, wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for someone in New Zealand who might want to use a method like this one here, for example. It's up to you to make sure you use a formula that you understand and are familiar with and is appropriate for your job. Um, once we've got that set up then, we've then established a link between this dummy drainage model with our seven dummy nodes and the catchments and they're all linked in and they should all turn um, solid filled with catchment labels there indicating which node they're assigned to. And then on our uh, global utilities model, we also linked in the overland flow model and so on our pit bypass tabs now, each node should have a bypass node telling us where the flow is going to next from node to node along the overland flow strings. But that's as simple as it uh, needs to be. We've virtually modelled no drainage strings other than these dummy drainage strings and we haven't cared about uh, pipe sizes or anything. We're not sizing pipes here. We've already got the geometry of our channels from our apply MTF functions all built in or it could be a survey model with natural waterways in it. Either of those will work, whatever's built into your tin and you run a downhill strings option to pick up the, uh, the one dimensional flow path along the channel and, 12, and that is sufficient then uh, for what we're doing here. A very simplistic model that's very, very quick uh, with a very minimum uh, amount of modelling. Uh, I'll mention uh, at this point that if we, we could all, as an alternative model all of these downstream channels, everything that's downstream of one of our drainage culverts, we could model that as a drainage string as well, uh, but there would be a difference in the way we model that uh, in that we would, instead of assigning the catchment to the downstream end of the channel reach, we would want to assign it to the upstream end and so all of the catchment flow from say this downstream channel, uh, this downstream catchment here, Z1A, would be injected into the beginning of the channel, whereas in reality that flow rate gradually uh, spills in over the sides of the channel and gradually builds up over the length of that channel. So whilst we're doing a very simplistic model, in some ways it's actually more accurate because we're linearly routing these catchment flows into the channels rather than injecting the whole flow rate in at a particular point. Okay, so there's pluses and minuses there. I might just take those TC strings off for the, for the time being. Um, but once you hit set catchments and set pick details, that's all the drainage network editor requires to get uh, the links between the catchments and the overland flow strings happening. And we can move straight over to the storm analysis panel now. And from here, we're going to run a major storm, a one, on, one in 100 year event using the Brisbane rainfall file. Uh, the pipe travel time, we're, we're not, it doesn't matter what we uh, do there because none of our drainage strings are going to have um, flow in them, where it's only about the bypass strings. And one limitation of the bypass strings in 12D, in the rational method at least, is that they have no travel time. So they're really just flow conveyance. The upside is though we can linearly route a catchment along a bypass string rather than inject the whole 100% uh, of the flow rate in at a certain point. So there's pluses and minuses there. Uh, I've also set it to automatically update a drainage plan plot and generate a report. And, on the, and I've got consider bypass flows ticked on. In this particular case, there's no benefit in considering partial areas because there's no partial areas to calculate because that's mainly relevant for um, pipe flows or where you have more than one catchment assigned to a node. We've only got one catchment per node and each one is going to flow to its node and then follow the path along the bypass strings to this outlet here. On the flood extents tab, I've told 12D to generate two results models here, my model of flooded widths and my model of cross sections. The cross sections are cut from the tin and are analysed and the flooded widths are, are created to fit 
perfectly onto those cross sections. So what the result will be is a set of flooded widths that will conform perfectly to our um, finished surface tin. Uh, the settings here are is where we say we want uh, at two metre intervals along our bypass strings. We're going to cut regular cross sections at two metre intervals um, and we're using a Manning's N value of um, 0.04 which is uh, a typical value for I say a grassy swale which is what we've effectively got modelled here. So with that uh, all I can all I need to do is hit the run button and it runs in a fraction of a second. It's all done there, drainage model updated successfully uh, it's, it's updated these uh, little yellow blobs of text down here and I'll, I'll add on my results models as well. So they are in a model called uh, Drainage Dummy Flood Ritz and I can see them on my screen now. So I might just zoom into a particular area there, um, say around here. I'll try that again, wrong button perhaps. There we go. And I'll toggle off my line styles to turn off the big ugly green arrows there because they're a little bit um, graphically interfering with my view. And I can see now the cyan flooded width strings indicating the um, depth and the width in the channel. So these are all normal depth strings uh, and they're calculated all the way through this model and I can see if you, if you look closely and I won't do too much zooming because it might make my uh, voice sound a little bit funny on this webinar if I do too much zooming but if I zoom again into say the downstream end of the channel you can see that the flooded widths are properly contained, fully contained within this channel. Now there's a couple of things to bear in mind here, one is that um, we are only generating normal um, flow widths here, so if you have any backwater effects or tailwater effects and things like that, they're not going to be reflected in these results. Uh, the benefit though is one, I th we are probably predicting the flow rates at say the upstream reaches of these channels more accurately than if we'd thrown all of say this catchment flow in at the top here. We're linearly increasing this catchment flow along the length here. So the flow rates that we're predicting at each individual cross section here are probably um, uh, quite a good estimation, possibly on slightly on the conservative side um, because we don't have any travel time from the other catchments. So once the other catchments that also meet down here um, concentrate at this point, they don't attenuate any further like they would in a traditional rational method or indeed in reality due to the storage effects in the channels. But we are better predicting, I think, the individual catchment flows routing along each channel ridge. Um, so the, the other thing is you don't just have to accept the results um, and say, well, that's, you know, we see it on the screen, okay. Each one of these channel reaches, uh, we can look at the individual details that went into the uh, creation of these flooded widths. So I can use strings, properties, attributes, and I can just pick on any one of these flooded width strings. I might pick on, say, that one and all of the details that went into the creation of this flooded width right at this location here are set as attributes and I can see at this point that my flood flow or my flow rate at this point in the channel is 4.3 cumex for instance, well below the capacity of the channel at this point. Uh, it gives me also the levels and the depths and everything that went into the Manning's calculation with these parameters down here uh, and I identifies the location of that as well. We can look at these results one by one using this tool or we can dump out a, a, a big report showing the whole model of flooded widths if you want to look at it at that level as well. Uh, just to basically re reiterate that all of these results are stored as attributes so that you don't just have to uh, accept the results if you're getting something that you don't quite follow. All of the inputs uh, and outputs are stored on the string. Um, so in this case, for instance, it's calculated uh, right at the downstream end that the peak flow rate at this downstream end is something like 4.8 cumex. Remember we had 4.3 cumex or something like that at this point here 
and even less at this point. At this point, we've got something like 3.6 QMEX, and that we haven't just had a sudden injection of flow rate because of this purple catchment just downstream. It's gradually increased uh, on the way down to the outlet there. And we can look at the results in uh, perspective view as well. So I'll just maximise this one as well, and I'll add on my results models, uh, which was the flooded bits. And one little trick to make this uh, look a little bit better, when, and what I have done here is using the visualisation module, I've made this um, finished surface tin, my super tin, uh, translucent using the visualisation module. That's one of the things, nice things about the visualisation module. Uh, one trick to getting uh, translucent tins to work properly is I need to set, using the uh, view zone menu models to front, I need to set my super tin to the front to make everything look fine. But I can then zoom in to say a section around here and I can see, oh, there's the little bit of uh, road pits and pipe infrastructure that's also in this job, which I haven't talked about yet because I'm focusing on the channels. But you can also see the, uh, the coal that's showing up uh, because of the see-through tins and all of our flooded bits as well. And it is a very good way and I'll try and do an orbit now whilst I'm not talking to, uh, to uh, see uh, a little bit around. But you can see it's a great way to look at the results uh, using the 3D perspective view, OpenGL and translucent tins. So yes, you can zoom in and, and move around wherever you like, uh, and it's a great way of um, conveying uh, the information to a third party, whether it's a project manager or a stakeholder in the project, uh, and it, um, you know, it, you've done an awful lot of work there in calculating Manning's formula effectively, uh, every two metres along these channels and doing a reasonably accurate estimation of the flow rate as well. Albeit we're not attenuating the flow rates from the more upstream catchments once they go beyond their discharge point. Uh, in reality those flow rates would reduce a little bit as they move further downstream. We're not assuming that but we are better assuming um, the, or estimating the flow rates within the individual catchments because we're linearly routing them along the catchments. Um, and in a nutshell, that is uh, everything I can probably tell you about. Let me just go through a few um, points to reinforce what I've just shown you. Uh, I would typically recommend this simplistic method of estimating overland flows for preliminary design and safety checks. There are some cases, certainly in the mining industry and possibly others, where this uh, kind of simplistic modelling where we're just adding the flow rates together rather, rather than considering the um, uh, storage effects or the, t or the travel time in the channels, uh, that would be uh, uh, considered a, 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 a more true version of the rational method, but bypass strings don't have that travel time. So some people will find that this simplistic method is adequate, even though it's slightly conservative compared with the rational method, um, and some people may not, but it's still a very quick and easy check to do uh, for preliminary design and safety checks. Uh, the reason why it's actually better for safety checks in a lot of cases is the primary safety factor when you're looking at flows in channels or roads even is the depth times velocity. That's the thing that's you know, potentially going to put lives at risk and sweep people off their feet and all of that sort of thing. Uh, and the depth times velocity is typically and, not, and quite often uh, at its maximum value when the flow is at the normal depth and that's what we've just calculated. So even though we haven't considered things like tail water effects and uh, the flow levels that we have calculated are probably are too low uh, at the upstream end of the culverts where the water tends to build up and, and, and the head builds up to drive the flow through the culvert. Um, the depth times velocity is probably a better one for checking um, the safety of the, the channels and the, and the overland flow paths if that's what you need to do. But just to reiterate, the, uh, the overland flow model conveys all the flows across the tin. All of our drainage strings run dry with zero inlet capacity. The drainage strings are just there to link the catchments and the overland flow model together. 
so that the catchment flows flow onto the bypass node, uh, bypass strings, and they stay on the bypass strings without ever getting into the drainage strings. And as I showed you, you can optionally measure the catchment length and slope with your TC strings, your time of concentration strings. And I don't think I mentioned the exclusion polygons, but I'll mention that uh, in just a moment. Uh, but after you run the analysis, you've got these models of flooded widths with all of the details set on them as attributes, and you can review the flow rates at each point and the depth times velocity and the channel capacity. Uh, the one thing to um, remember, though, is that it errs on the conservative side of the rational method. So your flow rates, certainly at the downstream end or right at the nodes, will be slightly larger uh, in most cases than a traditional rational method because we're not considering the travel time in the channels. Now back to 12D for a moment. Uh, one thing I didn't mention there was the, uh, the model of exclusion zones. That's this model here that I set, uh, dummy ex drainage dummy exclusion. What the model of exclusion zones is, is there probably are in, in many cases a few areas where um, your bypass string, and I might zoom in to one here. I'll turn on my line styles again. Your bypass strings, well, you're not really interested in um, the flooded widths going across the road there. First of all, most of the flow will probably be going through the culvert. Um, and secondly, if there is any overtopping, these flooded width strings may or may not be the right tool to show that anyway. So. If I add on this model called uh, drainage dummy exclusions, I've just, well, that's not the right one, my mistake. Drainage, there it is, drainage dummy exclusion. I've just drawn um, little red polygons basically around uh, where the culverts are. So whenever the bypass string, the green arrows, pass inside this red polygon, it won't draw any flooded widths in that area, and it just makes it, the model a little bit tidier. So I should mention uh, that as well. Um, and I believe that's uh, all I can show you. That's probably the end of the presentation now. So I'd like to open up the webinar to uh, any questions, and hopefully I will have some answers. Thanks, Owen. Yes, I believe we have time for just a question or two. Uh, Ian from Sydney would like to know, how do the results compare against modelling the channels as drainage strings? Uh, that's a pretty good question. In fact, I do have a, uh, another model I can show you as a comparison. So I'll just bring that up now. If I zoom out here. I'm going to add on a, uh, a different model here called DRX. So what I've done here, instead of just using the bypass strings, I've created a model that includes the culverts and I've modelled uh, for any um, channel that's downstream of one of my culverts, I've modelled that as a drainage string as well. So that's in this model uh, DRX with channels and I'll add on the DRX labels as well. So you can see these orange trapezoidal drains that have been modelled as drainage strings and I could profile them uh, should be able to profile them here. I might have to zoom in a little bit to make this easier. And I'll profile that one. So it looks a little bit strange at this kind of scale, but you can see I've modelled this one as a drainage string. That is a bona fide drainage string as a trapezoidal drain. And the, there are some advantages, and there's disadvantages too of doing it this way. First of all, it's more work to draw uh, to model these as drainage strings compared with the geometry that we already had from the apply MTF function and the downhill strings, which is quite trivial. So there is more work in modelling, but you will get um, proper consideration of backwater effects. You can see the hydraulic grade line here. If I were to compare that with the flooded widths we generated from the simplistic model, I might just maximise this and see if we can see this a little bit more clearly. Uh, I'll add on my uh, results from the simplistic method, which are the drainage dumb flooded widths. And you can see there are some points where there is, are some differences. First of all, at the downstream end, I, I probably, um, I may or may not have set a tailwater. There might have been a free outfall there where that one's picking up the critical depth. It's pretty close through here, but there's a, there's a difference here where we have a sudden, um, change in grade and a change in size of channel as well. The channel gets wider at this point, I believe. 
Uh, around the culverts, you would typically expect, and you can see here there's where one channel comes into another. When there's normally some tailwater effects acting there and the hydraulic gray line from the drainage string is higher than, um, than the normal depth of flow, which is where the little cyan crosses are there. But most of the, most of the time we're getting similar results. Uh, interestingly enough, at the upstream end, if I can zoom in there, um, you'll, you can see here that the hydraulic grade line uh, in this channel ridge here is uh, for a constant flow rate, whereas the little crosses here are indicating a uh, flow rate that's linearly increasing as we move downstream. So that's a partial explanation for why we're seeing differences uh, in the flow rates uh, at, uh, in some areas as well. So there are definitely differences in the hydraulic grade line, but in terms of the overall estimation of flow rates, go back to my plan view. Um, I've got the whole model in place here, and if I zoom in to around here so that we can see the numbers, you can see uh, for my simplistic method, we got a, um, an estimation of the flow rate at the downstream end of the channel at about 4.8 QMEX, whereas the, um, the more pure, I guess, version of the rational method where we model the drainage string channels, or the channels as drainage strings, we get 4.7 QMEX. Now this is um, somewhat dependent on what travel time you do choose for, uh, within the, the channels, and there really is in the rational method no theoretical basis to choose one particular travel time uh, over another. We've, we provide in the, in the um, drainage network editor a setting called the pipe travel time method uh, on the storm analysis panel. I'll just show you that quickly. Uh, on the global, uh, sorry, on the storm analysis panel, there's this pipe travel time method and you can choose any one of these modes and they do change these numbers for, the, uh, for all, your, all of your drainage strings. It affects how the travel time is uh, estimated, but there's no right or wrong uh, setting here. Uh, and so you can get the numbers to vary quite a lot. In this case though, this um, V cap, that's the Manning's velocity uh, in the pipe or in the channel. Uh, that we're assuming uh, as the basis, so the length times the Manning's velocity gives the travel time in the pipe. That's what we've assumed in this case, and we get numbers that are quite similar to the simplistic uh, number there uh, that we did with our um, uh, quick method uh, that we generated first up. So at the downstream end, you'll typically find that your uh, pure rational method numbers are slightly lower because of the travel time in the drainage pipes, in the drainage channels. But having said that, at the upstream end, and I'll just have a zoom in on the upstream end there, we'll probably see the opposite because to model, when I modeled this using this pretty much the same catchment model, um, I routed this purple polygon at the upstream end here and so all of the flow from this purple catchment was injected in at the top here and so my flow rate uh, uh, the upstream end here is 4.8, 4.9 QMEX and it gradually reduces as it flows to the outlet there because no further flow gets into the system and the additional travel time in each one of these reaches uh, gradually reduces the flow rate as it moves downstream. Now the gradual reduction is quite realistic, that happens in reality, but what isn't realistic is the uh, injection of all of the catchment flow in at this point. And that's, you know, when you're using drainage strings, um, that is the way it has to be, I guess, um, whether you're doing the rational method or the dynamic, in fact, it has to come in as a node. Um, the only alternative to making this a more accurate model would require a lot more modeling, where we'd have to break up this purple catchment into a lot of little catchments and um, assign each smaller catchment to each node along this channel and that would be a more accurate way and you would get the travel time but you have to weigh up all of this um, with the amount of extra effort and time required to do the modelling. Uh, there definitely are pluses and minuses because the simple method where we're using the bypass strings can linearly increase the catchment flows from the top of the catchment down to its discharge point. Uh, in some ways that's uh, a lot more realistic for uh, you know, quite a large catchment, you don't have to break the catchments up. So you can use less catchments and still be quite accurate with the simplistic method. Uh, I hope that uh, is a, a good answer to the question there.
Thank you, Owen. Uh, Charlie in Brisbane asks, which 12D modules do I need? Uh, that's an easy one. Um, you simply need the drainage analysis module, which is the rational method inside 12D. Uh, that's an add-on module to the drainage string module. So you'll need, as well as a base module of 12D, of course, which everyone has who's got 12D, you'll need the drainage string module and the drainage analysis module. Thanks for that. I think that's all we've got time for in questions at the moment. Sorry to those who uh, haven't been able to get to live, but we'll get back to you shortly afterwards. The recording of this webinar will be available in coming days through our website and our YouTube channel. Our next two training webinars will be Super Alignment Computators with Chains on the 17th of August and Super Alignment's Element Method on the 30th of August. We're taking a short break from these webinars because of our upcoming conference. We'll also be continuing our Industry Solutions webinar series after the conference, so do see our website for details of all of those. We'll keep updating it with many topics in coming weeks and also continue to keep you posted through email and social media. And so yes, as you can see on the screen, we have got that conference coming up very soon. So if you haven't registered, please jump on our website after this and book your place as we've only got a couple of weeks to go. If you need to contact us in the meantime, our details are on the screen now. That concludes our presentation for today. Thank you for attending and we hope to see you at future webinars.